Attention humanitarian and development professionals. Are you looking to take your career to the next level? Then you've come to the right place. Humanitarian Global offers self-paced online courses designed specifically for you. With our comprehensive curriculum, you'll build your capacity in the most critical areas of humanitarian and development work. Our course offerings include monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning, water, sanitation and hygiene, disaster risk reduction and management, food security and nutrition and emergencies, procurement and supply chain management, human nutrition and dietetics, maternal, infant and young child nutrition. With Humanitarian Global, you'll have the opportunity to grow your skills and impact the lives of people in need. Visit our website to learn more about our courses and apply today. Uh, hi everyone and uh, welcome to our today's session. Uh, this is uh, being hosted by Humanitarian Global and uh, my name is Anthony Mukuhi from the Academic Support Team. Uh, standing in for Diana, my colleague, and uh, today I'll be the moderator for this uh, session uh, where we are going to look into corporate uh, leadership skills and uh, the trainer, uh, the facilitator for the day is going to be Jashon. So with that said, uh, I can see most of us are still uh, joining. I would like us to give like uh, two more minutes. Uh, we start in the next uh, two more minutes, uh, in the next two minutes. Uh, so in this time, I would, uh, I would like to encourage you uh, to try to share the link uh, with your colleagues, uh, with other people, uh, so that uh, they can all get to join, and then uh, we can start right away. So in the next two minutes, uh, we're going to start off. So in the meantime, uh, try to share the link uh, with your colleagues, uh, with your friends, so that uh, we can all get started. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to our today's session. Uh, yeah, sure, I can see the messages on the chat section uh, requesting for like uh, two more minutes so that uh, we can have other participants join. Uh, so that is what exactly we're going to do for you. So try to make sure that you can invite your colleagues to join the session. And also in the chat section, let us know where you're joining us from. So you can let us know your name, your country, uh, where you're joining us from. So, uh, so that uh, we can also get to know uh, where you're from and uh, whether you can be able to hear us. So let's uh, keep on engaging in the chat section. And then uh, in the next one minute, I think it's going to be enough uh, we're going to start right away. So we have also shared the link there in the chat section. So you can see, you can find the link there. So feel free to share the link uh, with others. And then uh, we're going to start in the next one minute. So thank you so much. I can see a lot of engagement in the chat section. Uh, so many countries are being represented there. Uh, we have uh, Karamoko from Mali, uh, Mugest from Ethiopia, so many of them. And uh, thank you so much for joining our session today. So we are ready now to start and I would like to start uh, with a brief introduction. So my name is Anthony Mukuhi from the academic support team, uh, standing in for Diana. And uh, the main agenda for today is uh, looking into corporate uh, leadership. And uh, we do have Jashon who is going to be guiding us through that session. And uh, before we get into that, uh, this, is, uh, this uh, session is being brought to you by Humanitarian Global. Uh, which is a training organization based in Nairobi, Kenya. So that is where we are connecting from, from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, we are happy to be having you join us for this uh, particular Zoom session. So with that said, uh, I would like to start off by saying that um, uh, the main uh, focus for today's session is uh, helping us to get prepared for the upcoming workshop, uh, which is going to be focusing on leadership and project management uh, when it comes to humanitarian context and also the development context. So I would like to take you through uh, just in a brief manner about uh, what are we going to be covering in that uh, particular uh, training event, uh, which is going to be happening uh, both online and also on site. So as you can see on my screen, uh, which I'm trying to share now, uh, this is uh, where uh, I would like us to have our focus on uh, just to take you through. Uh, so on the Humanitarian uh, Global website, uh, you can always find all these information there. So what happens, uh, you need to go to the training calendar, and uh, this is where you're going to find uh, all the training events that uh, we uh, we have been organizing for the, for the last three months, and also the training events that uh, would be happening in the coming week. So one of the mini trainings that uh, we have there, uh, we're going to also be having social behavior change communication, uh, which is going to be happening next week. So that is uh, on-site and also online, and uh, you can find all that information there. Uh, we do have data collection for humanitarians using uh, Cobot Toolbox and also Open Data Kits, uh, and that information can also be found here, as well as data analytics uh, and uh, visualization using SPSS and Power BI. So that information is uh, also uh, being presented to you uh, via that link. 
So what I would like us to focus on for today uh, is on uh, leadership and project management uh, for NGOs and uh, development um, uh, organizations. So that is our focus for today. And uh, once you go to that link, uh, once you open that link, uh, you're going to find more information about this training workshop. So these are training workshop. You can see there's a brief uh, description there. And then uh, you can also share with your colleagues. It might be on the social media platforms, be it on Facebook. You just have to click on that button and then it can allow you to post that event on your timeline. Uh, you can also share the event via WhatsApp and uh, that is a well linked there. And then uh, you can also send it as a mail uh, to your colleague. Maybe you saw you came across this training. Uh, you'd like to share with the organization so that they can be able to uh, have their members being trained on this area. You can easily do so uh, by clicking on that link. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have the dates here, uh, which they are very important uh, because uh, these dates, they are going to be communicating uh, when the events uh, should be taking place. So we have the first event, uh, which is an online one, uh, an, on, uh, an on-site one rather, uh, which is going to be starting next week uh, from 4th of uh, December to all the way to 8th of December. So that is a training that is going to take uh, five days and uh, this is a full day training, uh, which uh, would be happening here at uh, HG Training Center in Nairobi, Kenya. And I'm so happy to see that uh, most of us have been able to register for these events, uh, for this uh, particular event. I can even see some of them are uh, being present in this webinar. And uh, we do look forward to having you come over to Nairobi so that you can attend these uh, training workshop. In addition to that, uh, we do also have the same event uh, happening online for some of us who might not be able to uh, maybe travel next week, by next week. So you can also do the same training uh, event uh, online, uh, which is going to take two weeks. So that is uh, from 4th of uh, December all the way through to 15th of December. So we do understand that uh, you are, you're working, uh, your time is a bit uh, uh, limited and all that. So we go for the evening time uh, where we make sure that we can meet two hours a day uh, from Monday to Friday for two weeks. So I would uh, like um, uh, to encourage you uh, to look into the dates and then uh, you can be able to register uh, for the most convenient uh, mode of learning for this uh, particular event. So with that said, uh, so maybe, uh, I don't know whether you can hear me, you can let me know in the chat section uh, whether you can get my audio. Uh, in the chat section, let me know whether you can get my audio as we go on. Okay, thank you so much. I, I, I can see the responses, thank you so much. So trying to wind up on this uh, particular section, uh, so looking at uh, what you expect to be covered in this training as the objectives, uh, we look forward to making sure that uh, you can be able to develop advanced project management and leadership skills. Uh, you're going to also gain a deep understanding when it comes to project management principles and also practices. Uh, also being able to acquire leadership competencies so that you can lead your teams effectively. And then, and then also being able to uh, learn how to plan, execute uh, close projects and also uh, this is a, with a clear strategic approach. So those are some of the many objectives together with how to make a significant contribution uh, when it comes to the success of projects within uh, NGOs and also development organizations. So looking uh, a little bit more into the, uh, the training outline uh, so that uh, you can get to understand uh, what is going to be covered in this course. So it's quite so detailed and uh, this is uh, to ensure that it can be easier for you uh, to get uh, the finer details of what the training is going to encompass. So looking at the first session, uh, we look into project uh, management fundamentals and uh, leadership skills. And then uh, you can see among the many subtopics there, we look into understanding project management. Uh, we look into leadership in project management. Uh, we look into project management framework. So that is uh, comprising the first uh, particular session there. Uh, looking into the second session, uh, we look into project initiation and also stakeholder engagement. And among the key areas here, we look into strategic uh, project initiation. Uh, we look into stakeholder analysis and uh, engagement. Uh, we also look into roles and responsibilities. So that is what we cover when it comes to the second session. So looking into the third session, it's all about advanced project, uh, project planning and also risk management. And among the key areas that uh, we're going to be looking into here, uh, we look into project scope definition. Uh, we also look into the work breakdown structure. Uh, we look into cost estimation and uh, budgeting. Uh, we also look into project uh, schedule development. Uh, we look into project risk management and also project baseline and change control. 
So you can see we get into more details when it comes to the aspect of uh, project planning and uh, risk management. Uh, looking into the fourth session, it's about leadership in project ex execution and also team uh, development. Uh, very key as a leader, as a project manager, you need also to ensure that uh, you can always exercise uh, effective leadership skills and also how to uh, also work together with your team and also develop them. So we look into execution phase uh, essentials. Uh, we look into team development and uh, leadership. We look into effective uh, communication. Uh, we also look into conflict uh, resolution and uh, decision making uh, together with the project review and uh, oversight. So uh, looking into the final session, it's about uh, strategic uh, project closure and also project uh, uh, post-project analysis. And among the key areas that uh, we look into here, uh, we look into project clo uh, closing activities. Uh, we look into the post-project uh, analysis and uh, continuous improvement. Uh, we look into leadership impact on project outcomes. Uh, we're also going to cover strategic thinking in project management. Uh, together with personal leadership action plan. So you can see from the course outline, uh, very much detailed, uh, trying to lay it uh, so bare in terms of what you expect to be covered in this course. And uh, maybe just to mention, uh, the course is uh, going to also present you uh, with the opportunity for you to have a certificate at the end of the training. And uh, this is a certificate uh, which is uh, which is uh, being endorsed by CPDUK as uh, one of our uh, you know, uh, bodies that we work with when it comes to accreditation of these uh, uh, programs. Uh, we do also work with, um, uh, you know, HPAS, uh, which is going to allow you to have a digital certification, uh, which is going to be very key when it comes to recognition of your skills uh, globally. So that means uh, you're going to have a document uh, which is going to assist you uh, when it comes to your career advancement. So with that said, uh, maybe just asking how do I get to be part of this uh, platform or maybe this uh, event? Uh, so the answer is simple because uh, once you come to this section here, uh, you can always uh, click on the register button and then it's going to lead you to a form. So make sure that you can fill that form. It's going to ask you very basic information about yourself. And then uh, once we get your communication via that form after you submit the form, our team is going to get back to you. So with that said, uh, I would like to say thank you so much for following up with my presentation up to that point. And uh, because I can see time is not on our side, I would like now to take this opportunity to say that feel free to engage us on the chat section so that in case you have any questions on how to be part of these uh, programs, you can always uh, get support from our team. So we're going to come there in the chat section waiting for your inquiries, and then we can get to uh, respond to you. So with that said, uh, as we get into the next session, uh, where I would like to invite Jashon, I would like us uh, to uh, you know, observe the following uh, rule. So when it comes to the session in progress, I would like us to utilize the Q&A section so that we can post our questions there. And then uh, we're going to respond to them towards the end of the session. Uh, so uh, uh, also at the same time, uh, let's keep our hands down so that uh, uh, we can be able to focus on the session. And then towards the end of the session, uh, we're going to give you uh, the chance for you to, uh, you know, uh, come over and uh, ask your questions, and then we can respond to you. So thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to a fruitful session together. So with that said, uh, Jashon, can you be able to hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you, Anthony. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. And uh, thank you so much for joining our session. We can't wait to see what you have for us, uh, in particular, into the agenda for today. So with that said, I would like to welcome you. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can proceed and uh, lead us through the session. So thank you so much, and over to you, Joshua. Thank you, thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, participants from everywhere that you're logging in from. It's uh, just about to hit afternoon from Nairobi, Kenya. So um, allow me to share my screen, Anthony. We'll also proceed to share our presentation. Can you confirm we are able to see our presentation? Uh, very much clear. Uh, we can all see it. Thank you so much. So my dear colleagues, uh, we're going to have uh, the next couple of minutes to the top of the hour to be able to make a discussion around two critical areas which are very much interrelated. So we're going to talk about corporate leadership and then at the tail end, we'll talk about project management. But this early, I would want to just mention and reiterate that project management cannot be fruitful. We cannot be able to get the results that we seek to achieve in our projects if we lack proper and effective leadership. 
if we do not have persons or a team or a coordinated effort towards the implementation of our projects, then our efforts and our resources towards whatever project it is we are engaged in many a times becomes uh, fruitless. And you're going to find that leadership is actually the last straw that is needed to be able to glue in everything together. So as you start on your project uh, management uh, implementation plan, you're going to find that you have a goal that you're seeking or that you're hoping to be able to achieve. The project needs to be focused on being able to bring in beneficial, uh, beneficial changes to the people or to the project beneficiaries. We will find that the, in the implementation of the project, you're going to work around a team. Not one person is able to operate and be able to deliver the results. Or even if they were able to do that, we are remember we are told that one person can only go uh, fast, but a group or a coordinated effort is able to take us far. So then we are going to need a team that is coordinated and that is being led properly to be able to effectively be able to deliver on the results of uh, the project that we are looking for. It is the work of the leader to be able to provide direction. How do we proceed when challenges uh, surfaces, when we are faced with uh, hindrances along the way? How are we supposed to be able to move forward? Which direction are we supposed to be taking? Which strategies should we invest in? Which strategies should we adopt to with the changing environment, whether it is legal, whether it is social, whether it is economic? At the moment, the world all over is talking about, uh, you know, carbon, uh, redu reduction of carbon in the, in, the, in the environment we operate in. So if you're a manufacturing farm or if you are, uh, you're working in whatever industry it is, then are you aligning your strategies towards ensuring that your strategies are friendly to the environment in which you're operating so that at the end of the day we are able to hit the ultimate success that it is we are focusing on of course we cannot end any discussion around project management around leadership without talking about communication and the role that it plays in being able to coordinate the team towards achieving the same objectives that we are having what are some of the solutions we are giving the partnerships and the vision that we have as a company or as a project implementation team that we're dealing with. So those and many more are some of the facets we're going to really discuss as we talk about the two subtopics that we're working with. So um, just moving forward then. So just quickly introducing who the speaker of the day is without speaking much about what we're doing. So I'm a student of life, of course, having gone through the course uh, in, in project management and a member of the Project Man Management Institute. And uh, that was just for purpose of uh, making us aware of who the speaker is. But for the objectives for this course today, we're going to look at trying to redefine what leadership is, probably tackling some of the misconceptions we have around the topic of leadership then we will go into some of the essentials of project management. Now, in the interest of time, allow me to just quickly skip in and uh, get started with the topic. And first, we are trying to define what a character and a hobby is. And the reason for this is because many people have approached the thought of leadership as a hobby. You'd want to become a leader when it is convenient, when you're looking for that promotion, when you're looking to make yourself look uh, good in front of others, when you are in a, a corporate event and you'd want people to see you as a leader. But we do not practice leadership as a character. While the essence of leadership, it should be a lifestyle that we live. A leader is not somebody who practices leadership when convenient. A leader remains to be a leader in all facets of their life. This is why it is not uncommon to find that your local leader uh, in the institution is also a leader or sums up as a leader in the church environment, sums up as a leader in the societal environment. All right. This is because, and, and even in the family setup. So leadership is not something that we practice as a hobby when convenient. Remember that a hobby is this thing that you do when you have some free time or when it is convenient for you to go and play golf or to go and do whatever it is you do as a hobby. But character is who you are when nobody is looking. So assuming today you are in a situation in a far country away from home and people are looking up to you and an eventuality has occurred and somebody needs help, Will you pass away and will, will you pass, uh, you know, uh, assuming, say, somebody has been hit uh, in, a, in, a, in a car accident and you are in a country far away where nobody knows you, 
would you simply pass and go or would you spring into action and try to find some help for this person which is what ideally you would have done if you are in your work environment and let's say an accident has occurred to one of your colleagues if let's say you are again uh you know you're walking at night nobody's following and let's say you find an, an animal that has been injured that needs some help would you spring to action to try and give some comfort or try to find an avenue of helping when you pass around in your community and you uh you know you go by and find that somebody left some uh, garbage in a place that is not convenient would you pick it and put it in the right position or because it's at night and nobody's seeing you'd pass it while if it were in the day and people are watching you'd want to make people see you for who you want them to see you for so leadership should be practiced as a character it should be what you live every other day which means whether you are at home whether you are in charge whether you are in the societal setup whether in the work environment if you are a leader then you ought to be that every other day and to that regard we say that leadership character to be able to build it it is not necessarily about skills so if you're working uh you, you know you're employed at your workplace you do not necessarily need to have the skill sets to be a leader this is why you will find that in our workplaces we have people who are not necessarily the most skilled technically in their areas but they still are leaders look for instance in your environment your ceo or your directors they are not the best let's say project managers if you work in the project management field they are not say the best financial experts in the environment if you're working in a, in a financial environment yet they still sit in those positions as leaders so to be a leader you do not necessarily must have the skills it is not about the skills that you possess now i am not saying that skills is important in uh, is not important for you being a leader but i'm saying that the skills are supposed to only compound your leadership acumen if you are going to be uh if you if you're going to be a leader and you lack the skills that is going to make you a weak leader because then you cannot be able to lead and remember leading uh, is a consistent with playing around a team you cannot say you are a team leader if you are not a team player this is why for instance for the fans of football you will find that the coach of the team will always show up in the training ground even though he will never be inside the pitch playing he will always play alongside his team on the lines uh, over the lines during training sessions the coach will be there for every training session unless there is there are reasons which are so fundamental as to them being able to not be available for that session so you cannot become a team leader if you are not a team player so then how do you play along with your team so if you do not demonstrate leadership character but you have the skills that are needed then your skills are actually discounted if not dismissed i would want you to think of a scenario you found yourself in or a colleague or somebody you know who was very good at the work that they do but they still lost the job or they were still demoted or they were still transferred yet they held the very skills that are needed in that environment so skills alone will not make you or will not position you for a leader now we have different levels of leadership that i want us to quickly pass through so we have the position leadership this is the this is the leadership uh, level that is earned or often handed by a higher level leader so you're working in a team environment then the ceo picks somebody and say i would want you to lead this department that is a, a position level leadership then we have the permission level leadership which is usually built around trust it involves you building trust in whatever subject it is so that you get permission to be able to direct them and again i want to drive you to a situation where you ever found yourself uh in a social setup where you have not elected somebody you have they do not have any written down leadership mandate but by default you find yourself supporting them or leaning in towards them giving you direction so much so that if let's say you are in a committee meeting and uh, you'd hear people make comments such as if so and so is not the committee chair then i'm not part of this group or if so and so is not going to be the one who is the treasurer then i'm not part of that group you know this is a permission kind of leadership where because of the trust they've built because they have shown their acumen over time 
as to the abilities that they have to be able to lead, you they get the express permission to be able to give direction. Then we have the production kind of leadership, which involves leveraging on your relationships to be able to inspire people to produce, to work, and to achieve the results. Uh, I would want you to look around again in your environment, and you may have not met some people, but you are lured or you are pulled to want to gain from their expertise based on what they have done. I, for instance, adore Richard Branson. This is the CEO and the owner of the Air Virgin, Virgin Group. This is somebody I've never met in person. But because of the work that they've done, because of the culture that they've created around their work, I've been able to pull towards them in a way that I'll look forward to what it is that they do to be able to help me in whatever it is I'm trying to achieve. This could also be built around relationships that have been built. It could be that as a, as a connection that was done by another person or somebody mentioned to me that, you know, uh, look at the work this individual has done, which is what happened to me. I was drawn to the works of Richard Branson by a friend who was keenly following on what it is they are doing and had worked with him in a in couple of projects. Then we have people development level of leadership, which will involve building and preparing others to be able to become leaders. Now, this is one of the very hard steps for most leaders to be able to prepare other people to become leaders. Many a times because of the fear that if you make other leaders, then you, they will come and take in, uh, you know, your position. But I usually tell people that leadership is about being a servant. It's about serving other people. It's about making other people better than you are, better than you are, if not as good as you are. Which then means that you should always be prepared that by virtue of your leadership trait and by virtue of mentoring others, you are likely to create stronger people who are then will be able to take over your positions. But the good thing is that when people take up the leadership positions you are in, it does not discount you as a leader. It only makes you a better leader having grown this and groomed this cliche of new leaders. Then we have the pinnacle level of leadership which is about building a pipeline of leaders through training, coaching, and mentorship. Now, majorly this is found in the corporate sector where the head of the institution will try to inculcate cultures that try to bring people towards being able to become better versions of themselves for purposes of either succession planning or just being able to nurture around you know, um, a group of persons who are able to be poised for as leaders. Then, I want us to talk about leadership and title. I already said that leadership is not really about the title that you hold. You can lead with or without a title. And I already mentioned to you examples where you found yourself in a situation where uh, you have, let's say, the CEO to your organization. You have, let's say, the head of the, your department. But people find themselves comfortable uh, resonating to, communicating to, uh, discussing ideas with other persons who are not necessarily the people who have been given the leadership titles that we have in our organizations. So lead, you can lead with or without a title. To be able to achieve that as a leader, always offer help necessarily and when needed. Always be proactive to offer solutions that are required. Be a team player. You cannot become a team leader if you're not a team player. Do not be go about the business of backstabbing others or going behind others' backs. If you are to rise your ranks, if you are to get your promotion, then do it because you deserve it. Do it dutifully. Always as a leader, you must keep your word. And we're going to talk about uh, integrity as a key pillar in leadership. Always keep your word. If you're going to say that in, in our organization, we are trying to ensure that the customers are critical in our business and they have to be served right, you must show your people that that is being done. If you're going to need your people in your workplace to be showing up to work early, then you cannot be coming in late and expecting people to follow the other. So keep your word. If you promise, always ensure you deliver. And of course, always offer hand without expecting anything in regard. As a leader, you must always allow yourself to realize that you do not know enough. Always keep learning. Never stop your learning journey. Have your mentors who can always guide you on your path. Nobody knows enough. Nobody knows it all. There's always something new to learn. Read very widely, not only on the technical areas that you're working in, but on in, basically anything that is important. Try to know what is happening between, say, Israel and uh, uh, Palestine. 
uh, you know, try to figure out what is happening with the, the oil prices around the country. Try to find out technically in the area in which you're working in all the things that are changing and that are developing. Try to ask yourself, what is this chat GPT and artificial intelligence that people are talking about? What, are, what is happening? So read widely so that you can keep yourself abreast with all that is happening. Have a very close peer group that would always you'd always lean on whenever things do not go right. So we are saying that if you're a leader, things are not going. All things will not always be on your side. So have a peer group that you can always lean on that and that can support you. you now have the relevant professional memberships depending on uh, the environment that you are working in, and of course, do not be in the business of belittling others. We have seen people who are junior staff rise and become senior staff in you know in the environments in which you're working in so while today you are the leader today you might need to respond and respect the leadership of the people who might be your junior at this point in time so do not belittle others you might need them all along the way so always think of your quest for wisdom as this hunger that you are not able to fully satisfy again as a leader always own the process be a part of the process. If we are going to need to see changes, then be part of that change. If you're going to need to propose that we adopt different mind shifts, be part of that process. Accept responsibility as and when necessary. As a leader, you should be able to commit to and be able to accept responsibility when things do not go as they were supposed to. If you are not able to achieve or if something happens outside of the realms, you should be able to protect your team and accept the responsibility for that. Do not blame others. Always have the mission and the vision of the project, of the organization, of the team at heart. And of course, you must remain original. Do not be a leader who tries to copycat or to look like somebody else. Then speaking about having the mission and vision and heart, we say that the heart of leadership is number one, always be knowledgeable, hunger for knowledge. Always expect the best. Does not mean that the best will always happen, but if you're making your plans, always expect the best to happen. And of course, do a plan for that as well. Accept responsibility, we talked about it. Always respond with courage. A leader is somebody who speaks with authority. A leader is somebody who speaks from a point of knowing. This can only happen if you're finished. Of course, you must always think of other people, what is happening. How can I be of help to other people that are in my environment? Having talked about the heart of leadership, I also take you through leaders and being reactionists. As a leader, you must be very keen. You must be very keen on how you react. The people that you lead, the teams that you lead, will always be looking forward to how you are reacting. If uh, you know inconsistencies or if inconveniences come along your path of operation as a company as the leader how you respond to that will be very critical in either making or breaking the team that you're working with so then you want to make sure that always take time to think and to reflect in any situation you always take time to think and reflect in whatever situation you are in do not be very fast to speak do not be very fast to respond always Make sure that you only say that that you will never regret. Do not say something that later on you'll, you'll leave regretting. Always do that which you will always be proud to share. Do not do anything that if you are caught on, you will be disappointed or ashamed. Only do those things that you are very sure that if somebody found you doing them, you'll be proud to share about them. Do not be fast to judge. Always take time to seek for clarity. Of course, always give the benefit of doubt as needed and also, do not trust your guards many times are always right. But of course, you are able to guide your guards through the knowledge and the experience and the reading that you accumulate over time while doing the right things. So we say here that as a leader, you may not always have a choice of what happens in your environment, but you sure do have the choice of how you decide to respond. So choose how you respond. Now, leaders have changed agents. Uh, so you want to look in your environment and be fast to adopt the changes that are happening. Do not be caught in the do not be caught in the environment where you are lagging behind when changes are happening. I've given numerous times the examples of big multi giants that we had in the previous times, like uh, you know Kodak, the famous photography uh, firm that we knew that lagged behind in adopting to digital photography to the extent that they were wiped out of business. 
So be a proud disruptor. When things are happening, when artificial intelligence becomes a hot topic, be the first person to ask your team members, what is this? How can we take advantage of it? How can we leverage on the new trend to be able to gain the one, two, three that we are seeking? For a leader, innovation is always something they seek every other time. Always embracing change, knowing that it could always provide a better approach to achieving whatever it is we are looking for. And I'm here to remind you that leadership is never and it's not about you. It's about every other person than you. So support other people to ensure that they win. Always ensure that you help people or the team you're working with to realize or to be able to achieve their dream. That actually is the essence of leadership. Always play with the team. Do not be the one person who throws your team under the bus when things get tight. If you are going through a tough week at work at the workplace, that is not the time to take your leave as a leader. That is the time to work in and be the leader at the workplace. If it's say customer service week and you are encouraging your team members to be good customer ambassadors, that is the time for you to put on that waitress's dress and be on the front desk to show people what exactly you mean by being customer ambassadors. Avail opportunities as and when necessary. And of course, uh, if you're going to work with a team, comment openly and castigate firmly, but very friendly if it is something that needs to be castigated. Do not be tied up or do not be bugged down by the thought of you helping others make them better than you. That actually is the point of leadership. Uh, for, uh, for a leader, you create the future. So again, seize opportunities as and when, depending on the environment you're working in. To be able to do that, you are going to need to be remain uh, energized and rejuvenated. So of course, take your time off, ensure you have a perfect uh, work-life balance, ensure you also engage in other activities that makes you more productive. Do not only uh, remain working all the time, which makes you suck at it uh, by the end of the day. Be proactive as a leader, ensure you keep people engaged on their toes, ensure you keep asking yourself, what are other leaders in my environment? What are other leaders in the ecosystem in which I operate, I operate in? What are they doing? What are other companies doing that makes them great? So remain proactive, always connect with the stakeholders, and as a leader, you must always initiate. Uh, so that is the bit I wanted us to talk about leadership. And I'm finishing by talking about servant leadership, which says as a leader, you must always see the future. You must always be forward looking. Uh, try to engage and develop other people. Do not want to be the only leader around. Try and build an effective team of leaders around you. They end up being your support system when things get tough. Always reinvent continuously. This talks to the essence of innovation and a discovery. So always reinvent and be open to innovations. I would want you to imagine if, uh, let's say, um, uh, there's a product we have in Kenya called M-Pesa, which is a creation of one of the uh, telecommunications uh, company in the, in the country. I would want to, and which is actually the first mobile money transfer platform ever created in the world. I would want to imagine if the leader then was not open to the idea of trying to innovate and provide this as a service what would have been of us now if that was not an, if the leader then was not open to the idea of innovation and welcoming new ideas so do not be the one leader who when you know your staff come to you and are asking you know i have this new idea of how we can approach abc you shoot them down and tell them you know we are used to this this is working for us we'll continue doing this do not be that leader value your results and relationships so when people do good be open to commending them value the relationships that are created do not go about burning bridges you might need them again when things get tight and lastly we're saying always embody the values do not be the one person that tells people you should always do this yet yourself you do not do it a classic case of preaching one preaching water drinking wine do not be that as a leader now, in finishing, we're talking about leadership values, which are, without going deeply through them, as a leader, you must remain consistent. You must hold high standards of integrity. You must always pursue excellence in everything that you do. As a leader, you must remain disciplined to the core to everything that needs to be done. You must remain loyal to the people and to the team that you're working with. As a leader, remain authentic. Do not try to be a representation of other people. Do not be a leader who is moved around or who changes goalposts depending on the environment of the people that he's, uh, he's working with. Be a leader who remains authentic so that we can know that as our leader, we can know that this person will always be on our, on our corner. And of course, as a leader, because you're working with a team, you must remain dependable across your team.
Now, who do you surround yourself with if you are going to be a great leader? You actually need a team called the smart creatives, people who are analytically business, competitive, user-friendly, curious, risky, self-directed, open, thorough, and communicative. People who are smart in all these areas. So of course, you will need somebody to help you with your maths. You need an analytical smart person, somebody who is strategic to be able to help you run around your business decisions, somebody who is able to look at the competition that you, the competitive environment in which you are in and be able to come up with the strategies. So surround yourself with people who are strong in each of the critical areas around a successful corporate environment to be able to see to it that as a leader, you are able to fruitfully navigate. Uh, how, as a leader, can you then empower other people? So always provide very clear roles. Your team should always be should always know what to expect and what you need them to be able to do at any point in time. Provide very clear roles. They should know what they need to be doing. Avoid being a complicit manager. Be proactive and be on the front line of delivery. Do not be the one person who asks people to send in their reports by, let's say, the end of the month. And by the second week after the end of that month, you are yet to send the reports that you are needed for you from you. Do not be the one person who insists that you know you must your team should always be proactive in responding to emails. Yet when you are the very team sends you emails, you take forever to respond to them. So be do not be complicit. Address cultures and skills which are ne necessary for the environment in which you're operating in. Ensure you create or curate a culture that is sufficient to support the environment you are in. Create a, a good feedback mechanism. And lastly, communicate effectively. And of course, talking about communication, we have the seven C's of communication, which you have to adopt as a leader. And speaking about those, we have, you know, you, you must always speak with clarity. You must remain concise, concrete, correct, complete, considerate, and courtesy. I'm trying to rush because I want us to get into project management before the end of time. Uh, you, you recognize that time is not in our side. So in periods of uncertainties, a leader can support others by giving people what they need when they need it. If staff are looking for support or staff are looking for advice or, or staff are looking for facilitation or, or staff are looking for resources, be there for them. Communicate clearly, simply, and frequently. Choose candor over charisma. Do not be the one person who wants to be a people pleaser. Only be very objective on how you deal with each instance that you're working with. Always ensure that you revitalize the spirit of resilience. Ensure that you are able to get meaning whenever there is chaos, whenever things are not going, going right. Be, able, be sure that you're able to settle down and be able to find out what exactly is the issue that you're dealing with. And of course, support people that you get to work with. So that is the bit that I wanted us to talk about on corporate leadership. Now, very quickly, I'll, I'll, we will try and wrap up on project management, but in just doing that, I want you to remind you that for any project to be able to be executed perfectly, leadership plays a very critical role. If the team that is implementing the project is not well guided, if the person, the project manager, is not, does not, uh, has not equipped themselves with great project management skills, then you will find that many a times the project is likely to fall into road bumps simply because of the lack of leadership. Now, when, when discussing project management, of course, we have the project management cycle, which uh, in a very easy uh, simplified model has four main cycles, it has four phases in the cycle. So we have the project or problem identification. Whenever you're setting out for a project management implementation, you must always ask yourself, what are we trying to solve? Why are we here? What is the main challenge that leads us to want to implement this project? Are we, for instance, constructing a new classroom because there is, uh, there is insufficient classrooms? Is it because the student population has grown so, so much that we, we need more classes? Is it simply because the donor has given us funds and we need to have it implemented? What is the problem that we are solving? That becomes a very critical guideline in being able to effectively implement and deliver on our project. Then after identifying the problem that we're going to deal with, then we now go into formulating and preparing for that project. So then we know the, the, the problem that we have at hand and we have figured out the project we are going to use to help cure the problem at hand. So then we go into the preparation phase where we now draft the project plan 
that where we now create a project team, where we go out and seek the resources required to implement the project, where we go out and get the necessary approvals, if necessary, let's say for construction, to be able to get the necessary approvals for uh, construction, if that is a project we are running at that point in time, if we, we need to get our approvals from the donors for purposes of being able to implement using the resources they've available to us, then that is the entire project, that is the entire phase of planning and preparation. Then we now go into implementation where we now put our rubber meets the road, where we get down and start our construction if it is, where we get down and start implementing the system if that's a project, where we get down and start delivering the the the, the sanitary towels if that was our project. So the project implementation, but of course, following the plan that had been curated. Then of course, in the course of doing that, we have to continuously do what we call monitoring and evaluation for purposes of just ensuring that at, at any point in time, our project is on course. Now, when we're discussing project, we talk about uh, what we call the project scope. The project scope encompasses uh, three items. For any project that we are implementing, we will be talking about the quality of the project. This is what exactly is anticipated. What is the final result? How do we know when our project is complete? If construction of a classroom was our project, then the quality to which that classroom is completed to, the, will, it, will it have PVC tiles at the end of it? Will it have... Uh, you know, what kind of roof will it have? What kind of walls are we placing? What finishing touches are we giving it? That is the quality. Then the second thing in the project scope is the time or the schedule. How long are we going to take to do this? Are we going to take to, con to finish the construction in two years? So that the project beneficiaries can plan themselves that in the next two years, we are going to be having a classroom which we can then use to do one, two, three. Then lastly, we have costs as a component with regards to the use of resources, the efficient use of resources. Now, as a good leader, you are going to need to be able to balance those three components to ensure that you are able to deliver the project within the quality definitions that were given. You are able to deliver the project within time or within schedule. And lastly, you are able to deliver the project with the least available or the least possible cost that is able to deliver the quality that is desired. And it's going to be your work as a leader, whether you're the project manager or you're the head of the organization, to ensure that this is doable and has been achieved. Then, of course, in, in doing the whole of these, the initiation phase, the planning, the execution, the closing, just breaking down some of the activities that happen in between. But I want you to notice that communication plays a very critical role in the eventual success of a project. Communication is between the inter teams, the, the, the team that is implementing. The communication is between the implementation team and the rest of the corporate team. Communication is between the leaders, the, the project leader and the team. Communication will be between the project leader and the leader of the organization. Communication will be between internal and external stakeholders, between the implementing team and the donor, between the organization and the donor, between the implementing team or the organization and the government, whichever way you want to look at it. Communication becomes very essential if we are to effectively complete or get our project to become successful. It is not uncommon to find projects that have been implemented, then at the end of the project, the users, the project beneficiaries, they find that they are not able to use the project simply because they were not involved. Communication was not forthcoming. And as a consequence, the project that was implemented is not the one that was being sought for. Okay. If I, if, 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 I, if I can give an example, in our local context, we have, uh, you know, a metro station, a, a train, uh, you know, a train that was created between two cities of Nairobi and uh, Naivasha, uh, which were constructed and very low uptake of that train was seen after its finishing to the extent that at some point the, the authorities that were running the station had to halt the train because people are not using it to the extent that they thought it, it was being provided for. So when communication is not forthcoming, when you do not involve the project beneficiaries, the project um, uh, licensing bodies, when you do not involve the government, when you, don't, you do not involve the FAF, the people, the donors or the financiers, the project implementing team, then you find that small disconnects could occur that could make the end product not be what it was anticipated or not provide the benefits that were hoped for. So communication becomes very essential in project implementation.
uh, moving forward uh, towards the end. So the project life cycle, of course, will be the series or the phases that a project would pass through from the start to the end, uh, from the po 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 point the project starts to the point it ends. And of course, we've already talked about the phases. And what I'm trying to show here is with regards to time, we will focus majorly in the in the latter stages of the project implementation cycle. Of course, at the point the project starts in the introductory phase, uh, I'll, I'll, very less time is spent over there. The majority or the benefits of the project are drawn at the maturity or at the stabilization phase of the project. So this is also deep in time when we have taken time to be able to consolidate and bring together all the resources that are required for purposes of ensuring that the project is becoming fruitful. Now, with regards to efforts that is required in the implementation of the project, we need very less effort in the conception phases and in the definition and planning phases. A lot more of our effort will be in the organizing phases where we are now bringing the resources together, where we are now implementing the project. That is where a lot of our effort is spent and also the amount of time is a little bit humongous. But I can tell you for sure that if you do not take time to properly plan your project out, then you will find that many times the project is usually earmarked for failure. Project planning is the most important and critical element in a successful execution of a project. If you do not take time to sit down and really understand what the beneficiaries are looking for, what the donors or the financiers are seeking to achieve, what the regulators in the environment are saying about it, what the government expects of that project, then many times you find that uh, a lot of challenges would uh, crop up in the implementation phase so much so that the project might not become beneficial. I took time to look at some of the documents that we get to generate in the life cycle of a project. So before we start, we need, of course, the needs assessment, being able to understand what are the beneficiaries looking for, what is the donor seeking to achieve, what are the government anticipates. Then we go into the business case. Does, does this make sense? Does it make sense to construct or to spend so much money for the amount of benefit that we will get when that project is completed? Then if the business case passes, then we also look at now what's the benefits management plan? How does the government stand to benefit? How do the stakeholders stand to benefit? How does the donor benefit from the execution of the project? So being able to, to make a report around the benefits management plan. When we're getting started, we have something called the project charter, uh, which is basically just a, a, a very crystal, you look at this as, um, the, as, as the policy or as the goals of the project, what we will intend to achieve when this has been done. Then at, at the organizing and preparing stage, we have what we call the project management plan, which now breaks down the project charter into small achievable and doable activities that when summed together, eventually gives us the final output, which is the project. So you can do this using the uh, you know the work breakdown structure. You can do this on Excel using Microsoft Project. You can do this using Gantt charts, whatever it is you want to use. Then of course, at the end, when the project has been done and when the project has been completed, we will have what we call the project report, which basically tries to narrow down everything that happened with regards to the project to the time where we now have the project ready for and over. As we finish this, uh, project life cycle management has two methodologies that we could follow. We could either opt to follow a waterfall approach or an agile approach. A waterfall approach is one where the moment we have passed a stage, we cannot go back to that stage. Now, uh, um, developments in the project management field is encouraging the agile approach to project management, which allows you to be able to go back to a task that had been completed, if you imagine it was not completed successfully. So it allows you to be able to reevaluate the success of the activities that you are undertaking so that if there is a need to make any adjustments, then it is doable, as opposed to the waterfall approach, which first completes one step, moves to the next step without the, without the provision to be able to go back to a step that had been completed prior. Of course, as, as, as in the normal environment, project will pass its risk. The risk will incur from a strategic perspective when we do not take time to properly, properly strategize for the execution of the project. 
it could occur from a failure to report when we fail to do proper analysis, when we fail to better understand the legislative environment in which we are operating, the legal environment or the government expectations. So you implement a project not realizing that the government will have expectations or not realizing the profit and incomes of the of the project, if at all it's a, a project that's supposed to be a money making a money making activity. Failure to have adequate policies in implementation so that people can come in and implement the project in a weak, in a, a, an environment that is, it has weak controls, that becomes an issue. If we do not take time to always improve on uh, lessons that we learned from previous projects, then that could provide for risk because then that would mean every other time our environment, we will be facing the same challenges that we faced in previous projects if we do not become a learning organization. And of course, our processes might, must all, should also be finessed so that we are able to continuously improve on and ensure that our project implementation goes on well. Of course, the risk, the risk, uh, the risk methodology or managing risk around projects would need you to first be able to know the risk that you are exposed to, that is risk identification. Then you should be able to assess the risks so that you can be able to give them a level of uh, priority depending on how critical or uncritical they are. Of course, whenever we're doing risk evaluation uh, or a risk assessment, we, we, we monitor or we evaluate risk on the, on the matrix of one, the probability to occur, and two, the impact that the risk will cause if it does occur. So much so that a risk that is very highly likely to occur but also has a very high probability of occurring, you'd want to give it out to third parties. That is why you take insurance for your cars, because whenever you're on the road, an accident is always a, a, you know, a step away. And when an accident occurs, who knows, it could be as bad as you know it gets. So then you, you, for that reason, you decide to approach third parties or you do away with that risk, you remove it from your matrix. Those risks that have a low probability of occurring, but have a high likelihood of, of uh, a high impact in the event they occur, you want to try and find ways of managing them. Then, of course, we also have the third process, which is now responding, the, developing a risk response strategy, of course, from the assessment, so that you know in the event that this risk occurs, then we have a strategy of how to deal with it. Then lastly, now, as and when the risk occurs, you now go into the, in the, into the last quadrant, which is risk, response, and control. And... Uh, how you can get yourself to identify uh, project risk. This has to be an inclusive approach where you play together as a team. Number one, you want to ensure that you identify all the risks that occur. This could come from the risk register of the organization or the risk register of the project. Then you will need to analyze the risk with regard to the project that you're handling to be able to uh, isolate the ones that are more likely and which could have very high impacts in the event they occurred then you now move in to be able to prioritize depending on uh, the assessment that you've done is step number two. Then you have to own the risk. And of course, as a leader, you do not go about throwing limbs. If you know that this is a risk that is imminent, is likely to occur, then you move on to be able to own the chances of that risk occurring and be able to put forward a strong strategy to mitigate against it as and when it occurs. And of course, you must always do continuous monitoring and evaluation like we say. And in finishing this, some of the risk response strategies then that you can give depending on the priorities that you have set for the said risk matrix that you're dealing with. So much so that some risk, you might decide to just terminate them altogether. Risks that you imagine are too costly for you to want to engage in, you might decide to terminate it. If somebody was asking you to invest or to implement a project that you know you have never handled, you do not have the expertise, you do not have the resources, your chances of failure are more than your chances of success, then you might just decide and say, no, thank you. We are not going to go into that direction. There are some risks that you decide to mitigate. These are risks that whose impacts are manageable and whose uh, likelihoods of occurrence can be controlled. You can decide to mitigate them by either preventing, putting necessary measures for prevention, to correct, to direct, or to even detect, depending on uh, depending on the continent in, in which the risk the project risk risk sits, then there are those risks you might decide to just transfer 
if you are being asked to implement a project whose resources are not available, but you have the skills to be able to implement, you might decide to take financing for it. You might decide to take insurance for it. You might decide to do a contractual transfer where you you implement it through another person or you do contractual transfer. And of course, you can also always combine one or, or more of those to what we call the hybrid model. Then last we're talking about, you, there are some risks you might opt to exploit and others you might also opt to tolerate. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the discussion I wanted us to go through uh, a bit uh, hurried, but for purposes of time, of trying to keep time, uh, that is the discussion I wanted us to have in the 40 or so minutes that we've had talking about corporate leadership and project management. So I will pass the baton back to Antonia, I believe, uh, the coordinator, so that we can have a quick Q&A session, if at all there are uh, any unanswered. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a total pleasure as always. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Jashon. I don't know how to term this uh, presentation because uh, it, it appears there's so much to cover. And that's why you, even if you can recall from the outline that I shared with uh, all of you, uh, you can see there's so much when it comes to this course. And that's why for the online course, we are taking two weeks to make sure that uh, we can always have um, uh, lengthy discussions when it comes to the individual taught, uh, topic. And also considering the on-site one, which is a full day training, uh, we're going to take five days to ensure that we can cover everything. We can have the conversations with you. Uh, we can learn the challenges that you're facing. And then uh, through our team, as you can see, Jashon is one of them. Uh, we can always uh, be there to guide you. So with that said, and also uh, due to interest of time, I would like us to uh, quickly go to the Q&A. And then uh, maybe Jashon, uh, you can try to run through the questions, um, uh, the ones because I believe there are ones uh, you might have answered as you went on with the session. You can uh, go through the Q&A and then uh, guide us through a few questions there. And then uh, we're going to also have like uh, three participants at the end of the session so that we can also get to uh, take three live questions. So I'd like to kindly request in the next 10 minutes, uh, we need to be done. So let's yes, try to, yeah. yes, uh, to yes, capitalize yes, on the time um, that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, allow me to just quickly go through the Q&A session. So I can see sure. Abraham was saying, uh, Adaptation plan to risk. I believe we've been able to talk about risks uh, in the tail end. But of course, as a leader or as a project implementation team, then you must remain agile. I talked about the two methodologies, the waterfall approach and the agile approach. The agile approach will allow you to be able to adapt to whatever changes or kind of environment as you proceed on your path towards implementing the project, which makes it very easy to be able to make your changes. So yes, it is important that we adapt depending on the risk that we are facing. So I agree with you to that extent. Uh, Coco was saying that some risks cannot be forecasted, such as climatic risks. In this case, what then do we do? So you have to remain open. Now, the good thing with risk management, it does not eliminate risk. It reduces the impact and the likelihood of the risk occurring, which makes it then very easy for you as a project manager. So if you take time to understand the environment in, you, in which you are in and have a risk register which iterates all the risk which we can be able to which we can be able to face in our environment, then at some point you will, you will be able to perhaps list climatic changes or climatic risk in your environment, even without necessarily mentioning the extent to which they can occur. Then you provide a tentative risk treatment or risk response in the event that ever gets to occur. So yes, I agree that some risk you cannot be able to necessarily forecast, but you can be able to have tentative plans. But in being able to remain agile, it then means that when a risk occurs that is climatic in nature and was not forecasted, then you are able to quickly adopt your strategy and methodologies to be able to cover for the new change that we have, all right? Um, somebody was asking, uh, give us some tips on how to create a good feedback mechanisms. Number one, as a leader, you must operate in an open environment. I do actually propose for having open office pl uh, plans so that you do not go as a leader and put yourself in a corner, which then creates that notion of power and might and fear. When you have an open approach to when you have an open approach to leadership, then it makes your team members open and free to come to you whenever there are issues. You can start, uh, and I know of organizations that let's say have suggestion boxes, but when you put a suggestion, 
if they are able to know who put the suggestion, you it is used to castigate you rather than to create changes. So as a leader, you must be open that number one, you are not all knowing. You are just one person who is put at the helm for purposes of helping others to become better. So if somebody comes to you with an idea, however weird or odd it seems, remember to remain objective, to be able to assess whatever idea they're having and be able to ask questions to better understand so that then you can be able to make now a clarified decision whether to go with it or not. Uh, what could be the project problem to be identified? Now, uh, I want to assume that we are working uh, in a local community and I have figured, for instance, at the moment our country is having El Nino, this uh, heightened and increased rainfall in the country. So if I am working with an organization that, let's say, seeks to help uh, children or orphaned children uh, in, in that case, then probably a problem that I, I identify could be that because there are heavy rains, which then means that there's a lot of flooding, this often the children could be lacking a, a comfortable place to want to, to sleep in. So then I could say that, for instance, I am proposing we construct a shelter in this region because so that we can help these people. So depending on the environment in which you are in, you, will, you should be able to identify the problem. But the, the point I was driving home was any project that you set on should be based or to, should be pegged on trying to answer a societal problem that has been figured out. So that was for Paul. Again, what do we see? How do you balance the develop, development of others with your own development as a leader? I say that the essence of leadership is to ensure others develop. If you do everything that we said, which is ensuring you have a close circle of peers, ensuring you read widely, ensuring you are open to ideas, then by default you grow. Let me tell you for free that as a, as a trainer for the past 13 years, I have found that the moment I sit with people and take them through a topic, I actually find that by interacting with them and by listening from their experiences, I get to learn things every single day. I learn a different perspective every single day. So I will actually be taking time to, to go through the Q and A session, Q and A session here to just see what everybody was saying with regards to project management and leadership because I do not take it that I am the one who knows everything on that topic. So as a leader, then as you continue to support others as they go through their challenges, if I come to you as a leader and tell you, you know, I'm having an issue, I was thinking I I'm having this challenge in life of trying to deal with this and this. Of course, you might not be knowing it, but because of the experience that you have, you might be having an idea. You can take some time to go and research, go to take some time to go and consult further. Then when you come back and advise this person, this will be something that you now have perfect mastery on. So do not be very worried about how to balance the development of others. As those other people develop, you develop as a consequence. Trust me on that one. How do you trust? How do you restore trust as a leader? Uh, when there's a case where something transpired which made you lose the trust. So that becomes very a very uh, poignant question. Um, trust is a very critical element in leadership. People, the, now there are two types of leaders. We have the leaders who uh, through spirit people want to follow them. Then we have those leaders who people follow just because of the fear that they have created. You do not want to be that one. You want to be the leader who people willingly and freely want to relate and resonate with. To be able to do that, trust becomes a very critical component. Do not lose it. But all is not lost. If that has happened because we are human and human is to error, if it has so happened that for some one reason or the other, trust has been breached, you want to take consistent deliberate steps to one reassure the people that you are committed then you want to take actions that are consistent every single day to show them that they can trust you back it will take time i will not tell you that it will take a day or a year it will take time but sure enough if you take time to consistently show that you are committed to gaining the trust back by doing the things you are said you're supposed to be doing then over time it grows back when people see you try hard enough when the universe see you go hard enough at something, it gives you the result that you're seeking. I think uh, the 10 minutes that we say have passed, and I would want, I not want to go above the timings that Anthony gave me. So I will post at that, uh, even though I recognize that I may not have tackled all the questions in the Q&A session. Anthony, if that is okay? Yeah, that, that, that is okay. And uh, sorry to apologies to our participants who might not be able to tackle all the questions. There are so many. Uh, but uh, what we have done in the chat section, we have shared with you our Discord uh, platform uh, link for you to join. 
uh, feel free to post the questions there and then uh, we can be able to uh, you know, uh, respond to them. So with that said, uh, Jashon, if you can allow me, uh, we can take like two live questions and then we can call it a day. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite uh, Kidan Miheret. I don't know whether I'm getting your name right, but I would like to invite you uh, to ask your question. So you can feel free to unmute your mic and then let us know what is your question as we wind up the session. So Kidan. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Now we can, uh, yeah, your, your mic is on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, please uh, do proceed with your question. I have I have already asked the question to share the the presentations and the recordings okay. for us. Then you you have answered my question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And I uh, indeed thank just you. to mention on that, uh, we're going to make sure that we can share with you the recorded version. Uh, so maybe quickly we also do have um, uh, Asefa get here. Asefa, if you can be able to hear us, you can uh, unmute yourself. Okay, as we wait for Asefa, maybe Veronica. Uh, Veronica, you can try to unmute yourself and uh, let us know what is your question. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Veronica, hello. Hello, Veronica. Your audio is not so clear. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Try, try now. Now we can get you. Okay. So to know, is yes. it that you wait to give feedback to your subject if she requested for it? Like somebody said, mm -hmm. you should know when to give to give feedback. So if someone is working under me, like uh, a team in my in my project or something, and she's not too performing excellently well, am I not supposed to give her a feedback? Should I wait for her to kind of request for feedback, giving her a feedback? Am I not supposed to give it to her, give her feedback uh, at that point? Okay, uh, thank you so much. So maybe Jashon, you can respond to that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Veronica, did I get the name right? Yes, it's Veronica. Yes, so uh, feedback should always be flowing, but I want to reiterate here that for feedback to work perfectly for you, you must have an open approach to feedback. Do not use it only when you want to castigate or when you want to pass blame. Use feedback for purposes that it deserves in that one, allow people to openly communicate so that feedback can both be top up or bottom down, which means the, per the person at the top should be free and willing and ready to give feedback to those below. And those below should also, in the same breath, be willing and ready and allowed to be, give, to be able to give feedback about. So much so that if your team member feels that there's something you are doing or not doing that is good or bad, they should also be having the chance to be able to tell you, by the way, Madam Boss, we are thinking because of one, two, three, this might not be a good approach. Now, if you allow and you make it okay to not be okay, when you allow to tell them that we are human and we will make error, and you as a leader, you are as likely to make an error as they are likely to make an error, then when that happens, we will use it as a, as a lesson, not as a punishment. Then feedback becomes very easy. Now, to directly respond to your question is, should you wait to be requested for feedback? And my response is no. You should serve it when hot. If I have done something nice, then as and when the closest opportunity arises for you to tell me that you are proud of what I've done, I should get that. Not when I, when I, many times when I ask for feedback, it seems as if I am coercing you to tell me that I've done well. Or when I ask for feedback and you tell me that I've done something wrong, it seems as if you have been waiting for the perfect moment to put me down. But when you just approach me and tell me, by the way, Jashon, uh, this and this happened last week, and it, I was not happy because of one, two, three, and of course you remain very objective. Remember when you when you are when you are uh, passing out a negative feedback, you do not focus on the person, focus on what happened. So that if I did something wrong, do not come telling me that you know, Jashon, you are very incompetent. Uh uh Tell me that you know your approach to work made us or made us uh, regress or made us fail to uh, capture this opportunity. Focus on the issue at hand rather than focusing on me. And when you give it promptly, I'm likely to take it from the point of love. When you show me how it happened, 
how it affected the team and the consequences of that and how we can better off finish any negative feedback by giving what we can do to save or to make better for the future then that becomes a complete loop in the feedback the main challenge with the most bosses is they will only stick out the negative you know you do this very often last week you did it today you've done it but you do not take time to tell them now you know how we can approach this next time is this way you know by you doing this this is how it affects the rest of us or it affects our deliverables as a team when you fail to complete that cycle by showing that person how their negative and undoings or misdoings how they're affecting the team or the performance or the delivery and further showing them what they can do better to change then that chain is not complete and at that point it seems more like blame game that is when why you are likely to hear people saying but so and so also did it but so and so also does that but I, I didn't do it intentionally but when you show them how whatever it is they did intentionally or not affects the rest of us affects the rest of the team and how they can change from it they are likely to take it positive but also when it comes freely when it does not seem coerced thank you so much i think that answers your question ma'am thank you sir okay you're welcome uh, thank you so yeah thank you so much jashon and uh, veronica uh, so unfortunately due to time uh, that is the end of our session for the q a the live questions i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, each one of you for making part to uh, making a uh, effort to be part of this session thank you once again and also uh, thank you so much jashon for sharing uh, your knowledge with us and uh, we do look forward uh, to our next session. So from Humanitarian Global, uh, we say thank you so much. And also remember for you to be part of the upcoming training, uh, we did share with you all the links uh, for you to register. So with that said, uh, we have come to the end of the session and uh, I wish you the very best, happy holidays in advance. And uh, we look forward to seeing you join our next webinar. So at this moment, uh, you can feel free to exit at your own pleasure. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to interacting with you in another session. So from us, uh, goodbye for now and uh, our lines our contact details on the chat section you can be able to find them uh, always uh, feel free to interact with us so thank you once again and uh, goodbye for now my name is uh, adam muhammad i am a humanitarian uh, person and a farmer at the same time i am also a nigerian my journey as a humanitarian started sometimes around 2016 in the NYSC camp. You know, when you finish your degree program, you need to go for a year training. So in Nigeria, we call it NYSC, National Youth Service Corps. So while at the camp, I have this uh, staff of Kuso International. Kuso International actually is a Canadian humanitarian organization that is working towards ensuring uh, no poverty and no equality among the community in all. So they approached uh, the serving core members at the camp, telling them to come and volunteer with the organization in providing services in certain communities that they will be posted to. At first, I wasn't interested because I am a farmer. Then I realized that there are several areas where I can render my service to. I can also render my service to youths, encouraging them to have a sustainable means of livelihood in agriculture. There and then, I key in, I applied, I became a volunteer. So, so after volunteering with Kuso International, then I then had the interest of working as a humanitarian person. I worked with Kuso International for a year.